Okay. We're going to talk today about uh, uh, a uh, phase equilibrium calculation. It's usually referred to as the isothermal flash calculation. Um, and the kind of the set of equations that you end up with to solve uh, is then often referred um, somewhat incorrectly as the Ratchford Rice uh, equation. And <clears throat> the, the problem um, kind of statement is um, that we have a um, A system that's uh, not sure why this is at uh, fixed pressure and temperature, fixed or known or whatever you like, specified. And you have um, the, the composition inside this container. Uh, the container might be a, some little place inside the reservoir in the production tubing, uh, in a production separator at the surface. It can be really anywhere in the system, in a pipeline, in some uh, control volume. So we know the, the overall composition and that would typically be expressed in mole fraction ZI the molar molar composition so this would also be known And what we're interested in finding out is uh, one, uh, how many phases exist, and for the purpose of this class, we're only going to consider uh, vapor and liquid, or oil and, and gas, if you will, uh, as the options. Uh, or a single phase. So basically the answer to this will either be one or two. If it's two phases, it's gas and oil, vapor liquid. If it's one phase, it can either be saturated, which is in a sense it's two phases, but you've got uh, one is one minus epsilon, and the other is epsilon. So it's it's like single phase, but there's this like little bubble trying to appear, or a little drop trying to appear. So it's it's single phase. You don't epsilon you don't see, but. In a sense, the second phase is just, it's kind of there, okay? The other kind of single phase solution is what we refer to as undersaturated. Where there is just one phase, but we can't formally say whether it's gas or liquid, okay? We can say it, it behaves like a gas, you know, or it behaves like a liquid, okay, but you don't know for sure. You know, I might behave like a girl, you know, dress up and behave like a girl, and you can say, oh, he's behaving like a girl, but, you know, he's actually got, so you don't know, right? So it's, so it's kind of a state that the physical properties of the phase, density, viscosity, uh, would be, uh, maybe clearly gas-like 
or clearly liquid-like, but it also might be a state where it's like in between. You don't really know. But the point is we want to know how many phases, one or two. And then the second thing we want to figure out is how much of each phase And that will be done in terms of moles, or uh, tip, more typically, mole fraction. Because we'll, we'll often, this problem will be, will be solved mathematically with the assumption that I start with one mole. Okay? So the moles of liquid become like a mole fraction. The moles of vapor become like a mole fraction. It, you don't have to do that, but we'll, we'll generally do this. So basically, it's kind of like how many moles of vapor, how many moles of liquid, but in reality, all we need is the vapor fraction, which is just defined as the moles of vapor over the total moles in. Because you automatically know the other one is 1 minus F of V. So we want to essentially know this. And then we want to know the molar composition, how the components partition. We've got methane and ethane and propane, and we want to know the molar composition of each phase. So for the vapor, it's yi. And for the liquid or oil, it's Xi. Any questions? So that's that's what we're trying to figure out. And this is this is needed in every engineering uh, discipline. From the reservoir through the production to the surface and the pipeline, you need to do this kind of calculation. Okay, so it's nice to know when you start pu pushing buttons on the software that you know the fancy software. It's kind of nice to know what it's doing. Okay. Now, the solution requires. Um, In addition to uh, the pressure, temperature, and ZI composition, you have to have that. Those are known. But it requires um, an estimate of the ratio, which we call the equilibrium um, ratio, component ratio, Ki. You need to know the ratio of yi to xi at the particular pressure and temperature and for the particular composition that you have, zi. If you write little z, it's just, it means all of them, or you could write zi if you want to. Okay, because So you have to have these, and this is this is called the equilibrium ratio. And now that everybody's listened to the videos, you you heard me talking about those in the in those videos. I'm going to repeat just a little bit to to um, to make sure that we've got okay the the these. K values for any petroleum system, any any system at all really, but in a petroleum system, we're going to plot pressure. This is on a log scale, the way I, the way I'm going to, and this is also going to be a log scale. So we've got um, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and so forth. 10 and 100 and 1,000 and we've got 
maybe one. I'll put this in, in atmosphere as a bar, for example, abs absolute, one, ten, hundred, and then we get out here, let's see, three, three, four. This is about as high as reservoir pressures get, where we see two phases, about a thousand bar. And for the light components, methane, nitrogen, CO2, H2S, at least nitrogen and methane, uh, the K values will always be greater than one because these components for, we're talking about for a given reservoir temperature, it's actually it doesn't have to be reservoir temperatures, just any temperature, it's going to be constant. And we're going to be talking about for some particular composition. Okay, I'm going to sketch this diagram. And in all the cases that we're interested in, <clears throat> I suppose with the exception when you liquefy methane, natural gas, that's a special situation. We're going to be seeing uh, the, the gas phase primarily consist of methane and ethane and nitrogen and, and so forth. And these K values will be greater than 1. There's a greater preference for those light components to be in the gas than in the liquid. So the ratio gets greater than 1. And the heavier components, certainly hexane and heptane and heavier, will almost always be uh, less, than, less than 1. Okay? So I'm just going to sketch like methane. I, it's it's going to be coming off of, the, off of here and try to sketch methane. So that might be what methane looks like. And then I'll sketch something like heptane or hexane. And it might look something like this. seven carbon numbers and you know propane might be kind of coming in something like this it, it's both below above and below and uh, anyway they'll it, it, all these components will look something like this and the slope of all of these lines at pressures less than about 50, 60, 70 bar, <coughs> down here, the slope of those lines here will all be minus 1. So down here, what you can say is that the K value of the component is equal to, <clears throat> well, it's proportional with um, 1 over pressure. Okay? In this region down here. And at higher, <coughs> excuse me, at, at higher pressures, we get uh, this nonlinear, um, maybe non-monotonic for the heavier components, uh, K-value behavior. And what's always going to be happening is that these K-values are always going to be pointing towards, at some special pressure out there, which we'll call the convergence pressure P K the K value all K values will approach one
and that convergence pressure is typically a function of the temperature and what mixture you have. So different mixtures in every reservoir, every reservoir will have its own uh, convergence pressure. Um, but these are the two main, main variables that determine uh, where those K values tend to converge. And then if it so happens that the temperature of interest that we're operating at, if it happens to be <coughs> the critical temperature of our mixture, okay, if we just have a, thanks, if we have a mixture and its critical temperature is equal to the temperature of interest, then they, the pK is in fact equal to the critical pressure of that mixture. Okay. And I can just sketch for you down here. Pressure temperature. And we've got the, you know, the bubble point it goes something like that. Uh, and then it goes through a critical point, which is here. And then it's got, you know, dew points. Like that. And the the critical, I'm sorry, the convergence pressure of a system uh, will look something like this. That's what the convergence pressure will look like. This is the, of course, this is our dew point, and the green is our bubble point. So you can see the temperature dependence uh, for a particular uh, composition. This is for a given composition. And in the SBE, in the phase behavior monograph, um, you'll find what's called the modified Wilson equation that gives K values that look just like the figure up here as a function of pressure temperature and convergence pressure. In addition, you need to know the component properties, PCI and TCI and omega I. Okay? And there's just a simple little equation for for K value at any pressure and temperature. Uh, for some given convergence pressure. But you need to know the component properties here. And this, this will apply at low pressures where you have this special behavior here with the minus one slope and at high pressures and it will converge as shown here to the pK value where all the K values will approach one. It ends up that where the K value crosses one here and here, for example, that that particular pressure where the K value crosses one is in fact
there and, and there, where it crosses one, is the vapor pressure of that particular component at your temperature of interest. Okay? Because steam, right? We're, we're boiling our water for the coffee. We've got the steam. It's at one atmosphere, 100 degrees C. Okay? And what is the molar composition of H2O in the steam? There's only H2O there. So it's just H2O, uh, the mole fraction is the moles of H2O over the total moles of the steam, and that means 1. So the so YI of steam is 1. XI of steam is 1. Right? So the ratio is 1. So that's why it is K equal to 1 at, at the vapor pressure. So, so that's this point here. And why doesn't C1 cross? Because this temperature is above its critical temperature. Okay? So this temperature is not along the vapor pressure line. The vapor pressure of methane goes up like that. That's the critical temperature. And it so happens that our temperature of interest will almost always be beyond there. So there, that temperature doesn't cross the vapor pressure line. Okay? So you won't have saturated methane at that temperature. So that's why that never crosses Ki of 1. So these are the K values. This, this is a good source of coming up with estimates of the K values. And what I said is that to solve this general problem, we need an estimate, not the exact value, but an estimate of Ki, uh, and we get it from this equation or charts or something. Okay? Any questions? We know the overall composition, the pressure, and temperature. With those, we can make some estimate of the K values. With those, what we want to do is find out, is it one or two phases? And if it's two phases, how much of each phase? And what are the YI and ZI, uh, YI and XI of the two phases? OK? That's questions. Any? It's OK? Yeah. No, the, uh, the question is if you have like steam, whether you have 0.5 moles of steam and 0.5 moles of, of boiling water? No. We're talking mole fraction of individual component. So in the case of steam, we might have one liter of boiling water and one bubble of steam. Okay? But if we only look at the steam by itself, Right? What is the uh, the ratio of the moles H2O in that bubble divided by the moles of the bubble? Everything in the bubble. Well, you only have H2O in the bubble, right? So the ratio is is one because you only have one component. In the in the one liter of water less the bubble you have basically only H2O there. So the moles of H2O divided by the moles of liquid water is also 1. So the, so the Ki is 1 divided by 1. Xi over y, uh, uh, Yi over Xi. Okay? So. All right. Any other questions? And
<laughs> okay. So then we'll set up how to solve this problem. And we'll start with uh, the component material balance. And that really says the total moles is equal to the moles of component I in the liquid plus the number of moles of component I in the vapor. Agree? Okay? We don't let any of those component I disappear, run off. It's got to be either vapor or liquid. Um, we have a total uh, material balance. that we don't lose any moles altogether. So the total moles is equal to the total moles in the liquid plus the total moles in the vapor. Okay. And of course, you know that the capital N is just the sum of that capital L is just the sum of the component I in the liquid and that's equal to the sum of the component I in the vapor. And when we define, which we've done before, our mole fractions as Zi equal that, yi equal to that, moles component i over, and the xi like that. Then we can rewrite, in a sense, these equations as Okay, and we want one more definition. We define, these are definitions, and we define that the, f the mole fraction of vapor is the moles of vapor over the total moles. Of course, consequently, the mole fraction of the phase liquid is just then equal to this, but by material balance, that's just one minus the vapor mole fraction. And we can also show um, that the sum of the mole fractions should be equal to what? One. And likewise, that one should be the sum of the mole fractions of the vapor and the sum of the mole fractions of the liquid. All of those should equal one. We're just normalizing. Okay? There's no, there's no magic tricks yet. <laughs> All right? It's just, this is chemistry. My son have, has a chemistry test in high school today, so they ask him these kinds of questions about moles and conservation and things. Okay? So this is all stuff you know. And then we've got, this is a definition. And we're saying that we know, we know this ratio. We don't know yi, and we don't know xi. We don't even know if there's two phases. But if there were two phases, these are the k values we think they would have. We know them from, from this Wilson equation. And they're defined as this ratio. Okay. 
So what we're now going to do is that we're going to rewrite this equation in terms of mole fractions. And then we rewrite that equation as this. That's the vapor fraction Fv. That's the liquid fraction 1 minus Fv. And this is the same thing as we, as we had the component material balance. The same as this. Okay? Just we've introduced these definitions. The same thing. But we're going to work with this one here. Well, if Ki is equal to Yi divided by Xi, <coughs> then we can write Yi is equal to what? Ki times Xi. Okay. So that now let's substitute this. Fv, and now instead of writing Yi, we write Ki Xi plus 1 minus F of V Xi. Okay, and then let's solve this for Xi, which we don't know. We also don't know F of V. What we do know is this, this, uh, yeah. So we know those two, but we don't know Xi and F of V. But I'm going to solve this equation for X of I in terms of what we know and F of V. Try to at least. But to do that, we do um, Xi uh, on the first term, it would be Fv Ki plus 1 minus Fv, right? And then I'm going to write that as f of v times ki um, minus 1. Do we agree on that one? That's, that's from over here. And then we're going to be left with the plus 1. Like that. Agreed? So then we just solve for Xi as Zi times 1 over Fv Ki minus 1 plus 1. Okay? Kind of looks like a magic trick appearing. You know, you know something's going to happen. <laughs> you know, the lady's going to split into two. You know, just don't know how. Okay. 
So we're kind of working our way towards something. But if we have xi now, we can easily get yi, right? So yi is just equal to ki xi, which is the same as ki over the same term. So now we've got xi and yi. Yes? Did I mess up? Time, oh, okay, zi. Thanks. Okay? I knew I shouldn't have written it like that. I just. Okay? And then it ends up that in 1949, this guy Muscat and his colleague McDowell, they published the first paper in the Society of Petroleum Engineers about using a computer. And um, they had to solve this problem in connection with that. And so they did that. And what they realized that this muscat was a really clever guy, you know, he was a real smart guy. He realized that to do that, there was a number of ways you could try to solve this, but the most efficient way was knowing that yi, the sum of yi was equal to one, and the sum of xi was equal to one, what would happen if I took this? What would that be equal to? Well, let me let me write it. What would that be equal to? One minus one would be equal to zero. You think he can't be very smart? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you can even rewrite this. Everybody knows that you can rewrite that as as that inside the summation. Okay? But, but writing this one equation, uh, I suspect none of us would have figured it out if I just said solve this problem. Because a lot of other people have been looking at it and they, there's a lot of ways to solve it iteratively, but, but doing this is very clever. Okay? Like it or not. And this effectively is the, what's now called the Ratchford-Rice equation. I don't know whether Ratchford and Rice are still alive, but if they are, they should be embarrassed, ashamed of what they did. Because in 1954, I don't remember exactly, they published a three or four page paper in the Society of Petroleum Engineers that gave this whole development we've done this morning they came up with this final equation a little bit further than that, okay? And they became famous, the Ratchford Rice equation. But in fact, Muscat and McDowell in the 1949 paper, in a small footnote in the text of the paper, gave exactly the equation that Ratchford and Rice gave. In fact, even in a more efficient, compact form. And Rashford and Rice did not refer to what was Morris Muscat's last publication. He had written two Bibles, 1930s and 40s, on petroleum engineering. He'd written probably 100 publications, this being his last one. And the guys, if I can say it, the sons of bitches, didn't even reference the original Muscat McDowell paper. But anyway, we still call it the Rashford Rice solution. And when you take that equation and you put the yi and xi here into that equation, then you get a summation that looks like this. And when you say yi minus xi, you have a common denominator, which is the f of v 
Ki minus 1 plus 1. And up here you have Zi, but now we can say that would be Zi would be Ki minus 1. And all of that should be equal to what? And all of that should be equal to 0. That is the so-called Rashford-Rice equation. You give it a function name, you call it, for example, h, and what you see is that we know zi, we know ki, the only thing in that equation we don't know is what? It's a single number. f of v. You define that function, and the only thing you have to do to solve this problem is solve this equation. You have to find which f of v drives this summation to zero. Which f of v drives the summation to zero? Once you've done that, you can go back into these equations here. And now you know everything in these equations. You know that, you know that, and you now know that. So you solve for one number, f of v, and you get both xi and yi. Okay? f of v is just telling how much of each phase. xi and yi tells the composition of each phase. So it's pretty incredible that you solve a single equation, let's just call it equation 1, a single equation for a single variable, and you end up finding out if you got n components, you find out 2 times n compositions plus the vapor fraction. Okay? Now, the 1949 paper wrote it a little bit different by Muscat and McDowell. They wrote the equation because it was computationally more efficient with this monstrous computer with bulbs and stuff. It was much more efficient to solve it by introducing a definition, ci, which was 1 over ki minus 1. They pre-compute that only once, okay? <laughs> do loops in the old days was, <laughs> was time consuming. And if you do this, then you end up with the equation being the following. Okay, you get zi because you can divide the top and the bottom by ki minus 1, and you get f of v plus ci. Is that right? So you pre compute the ci's, the zi's are known, and the only thing is that you have to note that for the ci is equal to 0 if ki is exactly equal to 1. Okay, because you're, you're dividing by 0. So, but it ends up that the term ci is 0 if ki is equal to 1. So when they pre-compute the ci, they have a little if statement. If ki is equal to 1, ci is equal to 0, else calculate ci. Okay, so that's, that's the form, and this is also equal to 0. And so that's 1 pi. So not only did they steal the equation from Muscat, they wrote it in a less efficient computational way to solve. So these guys should turn in their graves if they're not there, and they should be embarrassed if they're still around. Okay, so that's concluded. So what we'll do the second hour is I'll give you some uh, tips on how to solve this equation. We'll actually jump into Excel and I'll try to set up a little 
example so you can see how it's used. Okay.